Okay, we are on, uh, we're studying, continuing on our study of the imitation of Christ. And uh, just as my standard introduction, this is the, Vivekananda always carried two books with him when he went wandering as a monk. This was one of them, and the Bhagavad Gita was the second one. And uh, so that's the primary reason we chose it, was uh, just that. It's, it's, it's very Christian, obviously. The imitation of Christ is about as Christian as you can get. And uh, it's 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 kind of a handbook for monastics, uh, but inspiring in in uh, in every way. So I think it's useful for everyone. And uh, we don't know for sure who wrote it. They, it's it's attributed to Thomas Akempis, but I've read quite a few things that say that that's most likely not true. That it was probably one of his disciples uh, that wrote it. Just in the you know like it always is. <laughs> so the devotees always do inspired to do these things so we're on chapter 19 and we're on the second the second verse in there and the chapter name is on the exercises of a good religious and uh, last week we ended with that idea every day renew your commitment to the divine and uh you know that that's true at least do it every day like that but what i really like is uh you know in the vedanta this notion that every moment is new you know that every moment the world is recreated or or created anew and uh, so every moment you're renewed uh, every moment you if you can if you can give yourself permission if you can wrap yourself in grace uh, you're reborn every moment fresh and anew and you don't have to carry the burdens through in your memory from one moment to the next you can be free Learn their lessons. Let them let them drop off and uh, and run. And just know that at every moment, uh, you are not controlled by your past. You don't you don't have to uh, subject yourself uh, to old behaviors. You don't have to subject yourself to old accusations and old faults. That in every moment you are new. And uh, you know how many of the avatars? How many times has the avatar come? And given that is the primary message to us, you know, saying that we don't have to be caught in our karmas, that that is, it's not the point of, of, of divine love, but it's certainly one of the major benefit, benefits of divine love is that it keeps no record of wrongs. We know that from 1 Corinthians, you know, that, that love keeps no record of wrongs. And so it's not the nature of God to hold our mistakes and ignorance against us. It's the nature of the divine to charge us, to, to, uh, to encourage us, to cheer us on. You know, you can always imagine Holy Mother and Christ and Buddha on the sidelines with their big spiritual pom-poms. <laughs> well, maybe not, but <laughs> jumping, up, jumping up and down you know, calling out your name and just getting excited about you making any effort at all and uh, <laughs> and giving you more credit than you deserve for the little bit that you do. That's why Ramakrishna says, just do one sixteenth of what I've done for you, uh, uh, of what I've done for you, and, and I'll cover the rest. You know, so this is the kind of heart of the of the beloved. And it's it's the heart that grows in us as we expose ourselves to such a beautiful grace, as to such a beautiful love. And to find find our faith inside to accept that grace and to accept that as true and to let go of our past. So, yes, renew your your commitment every morning, at least. But always know that at any moment you can count yourself new. You don't have to have uh, your your vices, even if they're ganging up and starting to to crouch over the top of you on their in their temptations. You don't have to be subject to it. If you can find your permission and your strength to accept grace, to call out the name of the beloved and, and get out from underneath that mess, you can. And uh, you can do it again and again and again. You know, God is not keeping a record of wrongs. So you just keep getting up and getting back on that horse. Uh, my friend Philip told me one time, there's only one difference between a worldly man and a saintly man. He said that the the worldly man will fall off the horse a certain number of times and then just give up and stay off the horse. You know, he says that a spiritual man, though, because of grace, uh, has the courage to get up on that horse a thousand times and never feel foolish. 
for falling off. Just get up, dust down, and try again. You know, get up, dust off, and try again over and over. And so he starts today in verse two. He says, as our intention is, um, let me close the door real quick because there's another class going on. Just a moment. Okay, start at 7, 7 Oh, copy that. Want to find out that they were. Yeah. Okay. Oh, and Greg comes knocking at the door here. Like he knew. <laughs> <laughs> All right. As our intention in is, so will our progress be. And we have need of great diligence if we want to advance. For if those whose purpose is to do good often fall short of it, what shall the person do who seldom, if ever, makes such a resolution? Yeah, better a resolution made and failed than to not make the resolution at all. But this point here the, that he starts off with is a really important one for our internal discernment. As our intention is, so will our progress be, right? And this is, this is the importance of that bringing things into awareness about yourself so that you can be earnest and sincere in your efforts. Uh, so that you don't have a divided heart that you're not admitting to, right? So that you you stay clear inside and set your intentions to to be the highest, uh, and, um, and and you go forward, right? And and uh, we put great diligence into it, great earnestness into our effort, but we're undaunted by failure. You know, we certainly don't expect failure. We certainly don't don't make room for failure in that sense. But when failure happens, we are undaunted by it. We just grab that <laughs> beautiful woolly coat of grace and just throw it over ourselves and sing out the name and put our head up and, and march forward, knowing that the love of God is infinite and that, the, that God always hopes, always believes, always trusts. Those verses, again, from 1 Corinthians 13. And uh, and knowing those, that is the point of faith. Can I say something so bold? You know, accepting grace is the point of faith. Uh, that is the one thing that we need to have faith in, is, is the existence of a divine, unconditioned love, and that its greatest gift is grace, and, and that that is something we can absolutely know and absolutely trust. And it is through that trust through that trust and grace that we come to our realization because there is nothing that needs to be accomplished in us. There is only things that need to be surrendered in us. It's a, it's a matter of letting go so that that beautiful image of the divine that is what we are can express without being polluted by an impure mind, a mind that has the ideas of me and mine in it. Right. Right. So for if those whose purpose is to do good often fall short of it, what shall the person do who seldom, if ever, makes such a resolution? Let us then make up our minds to do the best we can. Even so, our good intention may be hindered in various ways, such as the omission of a good exercise for a slight reason. It is seldom that such willful omission can be recovered without a spiritual loss. The resolution of devout persons depends more on the grace of God than on their own wisdom. For human beings purpose, but God disposes, nor is the course of their life as they would have it. You know, meaning that, that it's, it is the grace of God that empowers us and strengthens us. And it's, it's through that acceptance of that grace uh, that we find our freedom in it and find the strength to, to transcend. You know, because uh, Lord knows there's a lot of wrong turns in, you know, 60 years of life, 70 years of life, 100 years of life. There, there's a lot of wrong turns in there. And uh, if you just keep that steady course, keep that intention strong, uh, you go forward and and the Divine Mother notices it. You know, She says that when you're if you're in the playroom playing with your toys, you don't call out. Well, she'll let you sit there and play, you know. She'll let you go ahead and do what you're doing. But as soon as you begin to call out, and how do we call out? There's lots of ways to call out. Uh, you know, recognizing our suffering is a call out. Uh, recommitting ourselves to our practice is a call out. Getting up from our failure is a call out. 
You know, these these are ways that we that we reach out, doing our doing our practice, uh, doing our practice, and recognizing that we're not doing it full heartedly. You know, all these things are a call out. Trying to control ourselves, not not exposing ourselves to to our weaknesses and to situations that will feed our weaknesses. Uh, by paying attention to the things that we put on the altar of our shrine, of our of our this body as a temple, those things that we put in our eyes, those things that we smell, those things that we listen to, the things we talk about, all of those things are uh, our cry, our 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 cries, our expression to the divine, and to become aware of what we're praying for, become aware of the things that we're looking at, become aware of the things that we're listening to become aware of the things that we're exposing our hearts to uh, because by being aware uh, our our nature exerts itself that nature of pure love that nature of wisdom uh, that that uh, the the sense of me and mine diminishes so, I'm not sure that means anything. Uh, so that means I need to plug it in uh, yeah, we might just lose that. Just to, unless you want to find it's up in my room there. But you know. if for the sake of charity, a pious practice is omitted, it may be recovered later. Right. It may be omitted. It may be recovered later. But if omitted through laziness or our own negligence, it is not a small fault and will prove harmful. Although we try our best, some failures will be unavoidable, right? So this, this pious practice, this, this effort of ours, uh, we shouldn't take it lightly. <laughs> you know, you, you shouldn't miss your daily practice at whatever you've committed to. Uh, you shouldn't miss that lightly. It's not a small thing to miss it. Right, because it, it will it will weaken a lot of stuff in you. It'll weaken your resolve. Uh, it will it will weaken your word. Uh, you know your your ability to say yes and your ability to say no and mean it. Uh, it will it will weaken your trust in yourself. Uh, you'll know that when you get up, that you you won't you won't feel secure in your change of heart or in your new effort. You'll kind of know that you know that you you've let yourself slide. And so being committed to our practice and to our commitments of practice is very important, is what he's saying here. It, it does have a, 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 a measurable uh, mark uh, on, our, on our own spiritual health uh, if we don't hold to it, you know, if we do take these things lightly. So, and he's also telling us in the same breath, you know, if you do, just get up and go. Don't don't let your mind become uh, ashamed, ashamed, or uh, uh, you know, marked by regret or or whatnot, resentments, those kinds of things. Stay positive, you know, but turn around with an earnestness and a sincerity, and just say to the mother, you know, I blew it. <laughs> I should have I should have done my practice and I slept in. And uh, just sit there and, and repeat it to her, you know, in faith until you feel it a little bit inside. So that, that's keeping it in that light of awareness and making sure that you're paying attention, you know, to do that. So although we try our best, some failures will be unavoidable. Nevertheless, we must have a resolve about something definite particularly concerning those things which are our greatest hindrances, right? So those things that we know are our greatest weaknesses, we need to have a real strength in them. We need to have a resolve. And that resolve is built by you sticking to your commitments. It's one of the reasons like uh, people do fasting, you know, I'm going to skip a lunch tomorrow. And so you skip that lunch. That's an exercising of your, of your resolve you know, to skip a lunch or to uh, take a cold shower or, <laughs> you know, to do an extra hour of meditation or uh, whatever. It's you do these extra little things, uh, 
not because they're important in and of themselves. They're just, they're just, they're barbells, they're spiritual barbells, you know? So it's like going to the spiritual gym and you do those things because they strengthen your will and they demonstrate to yourself a certain amount of strength. You begin to believe, you know, you begin to trust yourself. You begin to believe that, that when you say no, you're going to mean no. And that when you say yes, you're going to mean yes. And so these little practices that we do, these little austerities, it's the whole point of austerities, is to strengthen those spiritual muscles, strengthen our ability to, to be earnest in what we say, to be committed to what we do, uh, uh, to, be, to, to, to be able to be people of our word, uh, not to be flaky. <laughs> yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. flaky you know that's uh that's one of the differences between devotion and sentimentality you know devotion has a strength in it devotion has an earnestness and a commitment in it uh when, when you know devotion without renunciation becomes sentimentality it's 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 next to worthless it's not worthless <laughs> there's something there but it's next to worthless you need to have some stuff in you Ramakrishna talks about that. You need to have some stuff. You need to be made of something, some grit in yourself. And if you don't have it, don't don't bemoan it. That's that that just makes it worse. Just start doing little things to strengthen it. You know, just small things. They don't have to be big things. You know, like like when I first started, I love to tell people when I first started spiritual life, my big commitment to meditation was two minutes twice a day. <laughs> that, that was the barbell I started with, you know, those <laughs> is I went to the gym and I just lifted the bar. I didn't put any weight on it at all. You know, just two minutes twice a day. And uh, eventually mother took me into a monastery with that. Mm -hmm. So that's how it is. Make small commitments, but stick to them. Those muscles grow and that inspiration grows and that love grows and that devotion manifests and you're well on your way. You know, 20 years into it, you're just seeing things and understanding things you never thought possible and feeling a joy that's that is stable and and that you're established in. There's just a real happiness about the opportunity that that you didn't realize at the beginning. You loved it. You know, Takor was always cool. Ma was always cool. Jesus was always cool from the beginning. But you have no idea what's coming, you know. Went through and so through these little bit of little practices and small commitments, mother really does hold up her end of the bargain. Takor, when he says, just do one sixteenth, I'll do the rest. Uh, once you get going, you start understanding what that means. You're like, wow, I'm on an electric bicycle here. You know, one pedal and I'm five miles down the road. It's it this is this is the relationship we're in. This is divine love. So, but nevertheless, we must have a resolve about something definite we have to make our commitments and we have to stick to them and we have to do our practice and we have to make our effort uh not not because that's what's going to get us there but because that's what's going to make us uh respect ourselves. that's good that's going to be what makes us respect ourselves and to to have a sense of sacredness about our own inner shrine and our own inner worship it's what will put that stuff in us that, that Ramakrishna mm -hmm. says is necessary. We should carefully search and put in order both our interior and exterior, for both are necessary to our spiritual progress. Right? So we pay attention to not just our inner world, not just our inner purity, but we pay attention to the outside as well. We don't put ourselves in compromising situations. We don't flirt with our weaknesses. You know, I'm I watching my mind for these, well, probably close to 50 years now. <laughs> oh, my God. But watching my mind for 50 years, I've noticed a tendency in there to flirt with my weaknesses. You know, those things that I have renounced, uh, you know, I don't cross to the other side of the street when I pass them kind of thing. You know, I, I, I brush around them. That is that is a dangerous thing. I can tell you, <laughs> that is a dangerous thing, and it's it's one that if you're not putting it into the light of awareness in yourself, if you're just ignoring it and just thinking, oh, that's not a big deal, um, 
you you've got you've invited a caterpillar that is actually uh, actually a cobra you know into your life and it's going to grow into that cobra if you're not careful with that kind of thing so be watchful uh you know just ask yourself live live in the in the company of the beloved that's really the answer uh live in the company in the presence live in the presence like brother lawrence uh like takor talking to mother all the time uh, live in the presence and that will help you with that kind of behavior that'll help you with that sort of resolve in the mind so be on the look inside and outside don't flirt with your weaknesses don't flirt with your attachments uh, don't give a space for them to exist in yourself you know be aware and put them in the light and when you see them shine that light right on them go to mother and say look at that thing mother look at it look at it look at it <laughs> you know uh, that one time that i made a big mistake in the monastery early on my first year in the monastery made a big mistake and uh, when i when i went to swami prabhupada and told him he made me give the details three times in a row the hardest thing i had to do i couldn't just tell him i had to tell him and describe it and he asked you know all these questions and blah 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 why not to rub my face in it you know not to make me feel guilty about it to bring about awareness to bring that light in there so that i would look and see my behaviors and, and how i got into that situation and how i compromised and how i wasn't paying attention and how i i gave myself more more rope than i should have and so, uh, you know, and by the grace of mother, that was it. You know, it wasn't repeated. And uh, if I hadn't told him about it, if I hadn't put myself through that whole, uh, that whole practice of honesty like that, uh, I wouldn't have won. I wouldn't be a monk today. Uh, it wouldn't have worked. It wouldn't have happened. And uh, he told me that, you know, when I was sitting there bawling like a baby on the third mm -hmm. time I was describing those things, then he scolded me not for doing the wrong things. He scolded me for my weeping. He said, what is this weeping? You are a child of the mother. You know, your honesty has saved you today. Go to the shrine. And that's how it ended, you know, 20, 20, 24 years ago. And it was done because of that. It was finished. And uh, that is how you do it. You know, not, not the credit to me. It'd be better if I'd never been such an idiot. But nonetheless, if you're an idiot, if you are like me in that way, boy, bring that light of awareness. Make yourself do the hard thing. You know, tell tell your guru, tell your tell your friend, tell your your swami or or your spiritual buddy. Bring it into the light and let it let it be what it is. Because only then uh, will your ignorance be able to let go. Right, and so that's what he's saying here. We should carefully search and put in order both our interior and exterior, for both are necessary for our spiritual progress. If you cannot recollect yourself all the time, you should do it so you should do so at intervals. For instance, in the morning, you should make your resolution for the day, and then in the evening, check up on yourself to see what your conduct has been during the day. How have you kept your resolution? What have been your thoughts, your words, and your actions? For in any of these ways, you may have offended God and your neighbor more often than you think, right? So he says, if you can't do it all the time, <laughs> you know, if you're, if you're not able to keep that awareness going all the time, then at least set some intervals uh, during the day. The minimum being once in the morning and once in the evening. In the morning, you get up and set your intention for the day. I'm going to do my practice today. I'm going to do this much today. Um, I'm not going to, you know, you, you make your, you set your intention for that day. And then at the end of the day, and we see Takor doing this in the gospel at the end of the day, you know, we see him at one point rolling in the dirt. He's like, mother, what is this? Another day has been wasted. I have not, you know, another day has passed and I have not yet seen you. And uh, so in that, in that sense, we have to, uh, we have to take accounting like that that's how we keep ourselves in the light that's how we keep ourselves in the light of that awareness so we sit before the divine and say hey <laughs> did i do well today you know did i look like a devotee today did i live like a devotee today and to hold that to hold that in our heart if you want to sit over here <laughs> 
and you can see this screen if you want to. No, it's okay. okay. So if you can't recollect yourself all the time, you should do so at intervals, right? See how your conduct is. Go through. And if you've offended the Lord, uh, you know, it, uh, if you've offended the beloved, just put yourself in the light and admit it. Say it out loud in your, in your shrine. Mother, I did this. And it started because I started thinking like this, or I wasn't careful about this, you know. And I put myself in that situation and there was some willfulness in it. And I'm sorry about that. And I promise not to do this again. And then you get up and you're finished with it. Don't dwell on it. Don't make yourself feel guilty about it. Don't come up with some punishment for yourself. You know, just put it in the light, set it before the mother, set your heart right, accept the grace and get up and don't mention it again. It's finished. It's gone. It belongs to a to an to an imagined past now. It's no longer real. Arm yourself with humility and charity so as to award off these attacks of the devil, these attacks of your ego, your own ego. So arm yourself with humility. That means accept accept the faults. It means that, you know, don't try and cover things. How do we cover things? We want people to think more of us than they should. All right. We put or we do things to be seen. We demonstrate or make sure that we mention all of the good things about ourselves or hint at them. If we don't mention them directly, we we hint at them, you know, to so we get that praise or we get that positivity, but we don't ever mention our faults, you know, and we deny our faults by not mentioning them. So arm yourself with humility. Be what you are. Don't be something for some people and something else for other people. Don't be different in the company of the Swami than you would be in the company of your friends. Be the same person. Be what you are always. Be honest. Be straightforward. That's how we grow, right? So arm yourself with humility and charity, with, with just that general fondness for others and for God, that charitable positivity. If you, if you aren't living this way, if you're not in integrity, uh, you, then you won't, you won't have the self, what the self worth that, that, that will lead to an honest charity, to a service. It will be a charity to pay for something. It'll be a charity to cover something. And that, that's not, that's impure charity. So have this inner integrity and then your giving can really be giving because it's coming out of a full heart. It's coming out of a clear conscience. It's coming out of a self-worth, you know, because, because the light of the divine is shining in you. That, that, that confidence is there. You know that you walk in the light with the divine, with the beloved, and you're strong in that. So arm yourself with humility and charity. Refrain from gluttony, and it will be easier for you to restrain carnal desires. Right. Well, gluttony is controlling your food. So, you know, uh, and that and you can it can be just food. You know, I suddenly suck my gut in as I'm saying. But, <laughs> <laughs> oops. <laughs> so control your gluttony. Certainly it can be just food, but but gluttony can also be of, of any of the things. You know, did you sit there and binge watch Netflix for seven hours? You know, did you sit there and uh and uh play your video game longer than you had committed to? Uh, did you lay there watching Reddit until two in the morning, you know, instead of getting a good night's sleep? Uh, you know, these things go on. These are all forms of gluttony. And and if we don't practice that self-control, then we don't gain strength in self-control. You know, and we don't gain that self-respect. We don't gain that sense of inner integrity to where we know our yes means yes and our no means no. Right. And, and uh, we can't give the gift to our beloved that we want to give if we don't have the strength to muster it, to carry it. And so he says, never, oh, this is a, this is, this is getting tougher here. Mm. <laughs> never be idle, read, write, meditate, pray, or work for the good of the community. As for bodily mortific mortifications, practice these with discretion. 
for what is profitable for one may may harm another. Okay. Right. Well, it's he says as far as these mortifications. Yeah, the bodily mortifications, that's the cold showers, wearing the hair shirt, you know, oh. flogging yourself, standing for 40 years with your arms up and refusing to put them down. Don't, you know, use those kinds of things can become ego tools. Mm -hmm. You know, so discern, discern, do things that are valuable, <laughs> you know, control your eating, control your sleeping, uh, control your urges, you know, discipline yourself and, and stay true to your word. Those kinds of practices are much more practical mm -hmm. than fasting for 20 days or, mm -hmm. you know, drinking only fruit juice for a month or <laughs> all of these things. So that's what he's saying. Be discerning in what you're doing. Don't. Don't go doing the big and showy practices uh, that end up making you think you're something because you accomplished them. The point of our of our discipline is not to become showy. You know, I I did this. I can do that. It's to it's to strengthen your will so that you can be true to yourself. That's what these. That's what practice. That's what real austerities do. They allow you to be true to yourself. They strengthen you so that you can mean what you say and your commitments are secure. That's what real austerity is. If it becomes something you become proud of or something you become known for, uh, then it's adding to your demise. It's, it's feeding your ego. And your ego is the veil. Ego and maya is uh, our equivalent in that case. Ego is the veil that prevents you from seeing the divine nature in yourself, from seeing God within you. And from being able to commune with the beloved in the heart, in the shrine of yourself. Personal penitential practices are best done in private. Right? And Jesus says, go into the closet to pray. Don't, don't stand out like the publicans do on the front steps of the temple, holding your hands up to God and praying out loud. You know, we see that at, at subway stations in every city in America. You know, the person out there with his blowhorn yelling the name of Jesus, you know, converting no one, but bothering everyone, yeah. you know, making, making a light, making a show of your, of your, of your love of God. Personal penitential practices are best done in private and not openly for others to see because, because the ego is a reality, you know. Do not be more inclined to the devotions of your own choosing than to those that are of religious obligation. When you have faithfully fulfilled your obligation, then if there is time left, you may, you may perform those devotions according to your inspiration. Right? So uh, devotions of your own choosing than to those of religious obligation. So this is more of a monastic reference here. You know, like uh, in a Christian monastery, you have to go to the, you have to do these offices almost every, like th every three or four hours all day long, you go to the church and you sit there and you put your cassock on and you chant some psalms, you sing some things, you do some prayer, you do mass or whatever it is. And every couple of hours you have to go and do all of these community obligations, obligations of being a monk. And he's saying here, don't, don't give, don't make one more important than the other. Just, just do them all. Don't just do the ones you like. Don't, don't, don't just emphasize the ones you're good at. Keep them all on an even par. Keep your practice steady, right? So be as committed to the things that aren't pleasant for you as you are to the things that are pleasant for you or that you're good for. When you have faithfully fulfilled your obligation, then if there's time left, you can perform those devotions according to your inspiration, the ones that you like, the ones that you're good at, you know? Go ahead and fulfill your obligations, which if you're not a monastic, I don't think he's really talking about anything more than that at this point but it's just having that even keel uh, don't spend more time on the things that you like un unless you have done all the things that you're supposed to be doing the same pious practices are not practical for everyone for one for one suits one person while another suits someone else we see this in ramakrishna quite a bit uh, you know he doesn't he doesn't give people the same instructions he really looks at their weaknesses, you know, to one disciple who was kind of mealy mouthed when he heard, heard someone saying bad things about his guru. He didn't stand up for his guru. And uh, Ramakrishna 
tells them you should stand up for your guru. How can you stop and listen to people down and, you know, talking bad about your guru and you not say something. And then another disciple who's very, who had a much more bold personality, uh, you know, threatens to turn the boat over because people are speaking poorly of Ramakrishna, you know, and, and really kind of puts his fist down about it. And Ramakrishna scolds him and says, so what? They were talking bad about your guru. But what is that to you? You know, so it's rules aren't rules. Just because it's good for one person does not mean it's good for another. And that's between you and your guru, you know, your guru. So don't look for a consistency. Don't if your guru, if you know that your friend has the same guru and your guru has told told them they only have to meditate, you know, once a week. <laughs> but your guru tells you you have to meditate four times a day. Don't be like, oh, well, there, there you only have to do it once a week. I'm just going to do it once a week. <laughs> it's not like that, right? So you do it, do what your guru says and understand that it's not the same for everybody. So don't you go telling everybody to do what your guru told you to do. That's not your place. You know, your spiritual life is between you and your guru and your friend's spiritual life is between them and their guru. Don't make other people's spiritual life your business. Don't judge them because you don't know what their instructions are. Don't judge them because you are not a guru. You don't know. So it's not, not your business. You pay attention to your own self. You do what you need to do and, and be true to that. Different exercises are required for different times. Some being more applicable for holy days, others for ordinary days. Also, we need one kind in time of temptation and another in a time of peace and quiet. One when we have devotion and another when our devotion is absent. Right? So different emphasis at different times. Um, but just in the practices that you're doing, you know, like, um, uh, you know, like on Lent, you, you know, you're doing a, a particular practice during Lent that's appropriate because it's Lent. But don't do that at Christmas. You know, it's kind of different, different things at different times for different needs. of time. As the principal feasts occur, we must renew our pious practices according to the spirit of the feast, fervently asking the saints to help us. As the liturgical year unfolds, we should make our resolutions as if we were then to leave this world for the everlasting feast in heaven. In this way, we ought to prepare ourselves at holy seasons, living more devoutly and performing our duties more exactly as if we were soon to go before God to receive the reward of our labors. But if it be delayed, we can be sure that we were neither ready nor prepared for that glory, which will be revealed to us in God's time. Let us then prepare ourselves better for the appointed time. In St. Luke's gospel, we read, blessed is that servant if his master finds him watching when he arrives home. Truly, I tell you, he will, be, he will put him in charge of all of his property. So this is just that notion. <laughs> Be true. <laughs> be true to yourself. Be in the presence of the law of the divine. Don't don't get caught not paying attention. Don't get caught being lax. This is a particularly Christian slant that he's taking here, and a, and a monastic one when he's talking about these different feasts at different seasons. Because all I know from from that year up at Saint at uh, Holy Cross Monastery that. The whole year has kind of a flow to it from one holiday to the next within the monastery. And each each season has its emphasis. One season for repentance, one season for love, loving service, one season for joyful celebration. You know, so like the whole year kind of flows from one mood to the next. And he's just telling him as a monk, be in that flow, you know, dedicate yourself to that flow. Do the things. Don't keep your Christmas lights up all year long. <laughs> Christmas lights stay up at Christmas. <laughs> so it's that kind of thing. You know, let, let the flow happen as it should. Let the discipline follow through the course uh, as it is. Yes. Oh, okay. Hi, oh, hi. hi. All right. So mm -hmm. chapter 20. Anybody have any questions at this point or any concerns? In there, 
I could ask him for a question. Chapter 20, On the Love of Solitude and Silence. Oh, wow, that's going to be, this is going to be a beautiful one. Seek a convenient time to search your own conscience, meditating on the benefits of God. Restrain curiosity. Read only those things that will move you to contrition rather than to give you distraction. That's a tall teaching right there. That's a challenge. You know, seek a convenient time, right? So, so have that dedicated time to where you really go inside and do a practice, really sit in the presence of God. But restrain curiosity. You know, don't, uh, don't, don't feed just idle curiosities. Don't go looking just for entertainment for entertainment's sake. That's a that's a tall one. If you do, at least put constraints on it. You know, say, okay, I, I'm going to go ahead and watch TV. Uh, you know, my favorite show. But when my favorite show is over, I'm going to turn the TV off and carry on with what I what I need to do. You know, so I, I don't don't overdo this one. <laughs> but control yourself. It's this is really it. Live in awareness. This is what we're getting at. Live in the presence of the divine. And uh, if you're living in the presence of the divine, almost anything goes. Uh, if you're if you're being honest about it, you know it's like um, quite often I've done this where where the mind just really wants to go to the cafe and get a cup of coffee. You know, uh, as a monk, that's not necessarily a great thing to do. Uh, but if you go and you take a take a spiritual book with you or you just go and sip your coffee and sit there and have a mental conversation like mother is having coffee with you, uh, you know, that is better than just going and blanking out and being entertained. You know, if you want to, if you want to watch, uh, <laughs> if you want to watch Saturday night live, uh, watch it with mother. You know, that's what, that's what the, what she told Girish, what Ramakrishna told Girish, you know, that that bring mother into all aspects of your life, even the ones that aren't ideal. Bring her into it because she is your ideal. And with her company, she will lift you up. You know, so you don't have to beat your mind. You don't you don't have to, you know, always be rigid in these things. Remember that love is there and enjoy that love with God, not for license. But to but bring God into your life. You don't you don't have to do. You don't have to keep the note, at at D all the time. You know you don't have to. You can't hold that note forever. And God knows this. And so when you when you sing the lower notes, just sing them with the same devotion that you sing the higher notes, mm. like that. You know. So bring God into all aspects of your life. If uh, you know, I know, um, gaming, all those things. Just carry on a conversation with the divine. Pretend the divine is on the other end. You know, <laughs> not sure. Whatever it is, mm -hmm. I you know, these are things <laughs> that we just bring out, bring God into our life. Mm -hmm. uh, just keep your keep your mind on God, and God is everywhere present. And so, you know, that's what I say. If you spiritualize everything, you can live like Takor. You can go to plays. You can go to the concerts. You can go dancing in the streets. You can, you know, all those things are fine. If you don't take the Lord with you, all those things can be detrimental to you. They can they can weaken you, you know, and expose you to to your your weaknesses, your vices. So spiritualize your life. Take mother with you everywhere you go. Uh, you know, I when I would see a, a beautiful person on the street and it would cause my mind to kind of trip for a second, I would compliment mother, you know, oh mother, you look wonderful like that in that outfit today. Mm -hmm. You know, you're beautiful. Look at look at mother. I see your beauty in that today. So you you spiritualize things, and it keeps your mind from from falling, you know, from from embarrassing yourself. Uh, so there's like that, or like Girish, offer that glass of wine. Hey, okay, I'm gonna have a glass of wine. Okay, we'll have it with mother. Offer it to mother as you drink it. Share with her what you're getting out of it, how you're enjoying it. Tell her about the taste. Tell her about the feeling. Tell her whatever. But keep that channel open. Keep that relationship open uh, with the divine. Because that presence will bring you home. That presence will manifest your perfection. So.
So we have to be friends with the mind. We can't always be the tyrant with ourselves. There has to be a gentleness uh, with as we because your mind is your disciple, right? Don't don't think your mind is you. If you if you happen to have a an unruly mind that's angry and lustful. Well, don't identify with it. Don't don't think, oh, I'm angry and I'm lustful. That's not helpful. Say, oh gosh, I'm tied to a lusty and, and <laughs> angry mind. You like uh, there's a great <laughs> there's a great poem by Hafiz where he complains to God that's like, God, why did you why did you make me cross this desert tied to the back end of a farting camel? <laughs> <laughs> so it's <laughs> It's having that kind of attitude. You're tied to a farting camel. You've got an impure mind, you know, that's good, that's weak and got lots of struggles. And uh, complain to mother about it. Say, oh, ma, why? Why did you give me a mind like this? Look at this thing. It's broken down. It stinks. It's old. It's cranky. You know, it's choosy. It's, it's whatever, whatever the weakness is. Don't own it. It doesn't describe you. So don't don't use that I in there. Don't say, oh, I'm broken down and I'm stinky and I'm, you know, lusty and angry. Don't do that. Keep it separate and keep the mother present and look at it and name it. You know, name it. Let it see it for what it is. Uh, you know, because the mind is your disciple and the mind will grow. The mind will begin to behave. Uh, with that kind of steady love and acceptance in in the light of awareness, right? In that light of awareness, don't don't get caught uh, in all in those situations by owning it, by thinking it describes you. Always keep that separate, right? All desires arise from either the body or the mind, and you are neither of them. You are the self. You're the third thing in there, in your inner world. And you'll know through practice and through discernment, you'll come to see that that which is you, the witness, never expresses a desire. The desire is always bodied oriented or mind oriented. And you just, you once you see that, recognize it, name it as belonging to the body and mind. And then remember the body and mind have nothing to do with me. When this body and mind drops, with the with the when this body drops, they'll go away, and what will be left? This shining pure self. And uh, always hold that very dear to your heart, because that's the greatest gift of the mother, was her putting her image within you, right? Putting that Atman within you, then you can know that our discerning between body and mind is to set us free from our very own karma caused by identifying with the body and mind. So we find that freedom in there. So keep that, keep that going. Search your conscience. Be discerning inside. Know what is yours and what isn't yours. And always remember, I am ever free. I am ever pure. I am beloved of God. I am sitting in grace. I'm sitting in an infinite, an infinite love that has no limit. And, and enjoy that space and remind and remind yourself always. But drag that, that soggy, soiled mind <laughs> into the same room and sit there and look at Mother and just talk to her about it. Always keep that light alive. And you'll be fine. You'll find your way home. You will come to a great bliss if you're earnest and consistent and sincere in your effort. All right, that's where we're going to leave that.